Hello, and welcome to the last uh, in our series of webinars on decarbonization, pathways to a decarbonized economy and a more livable planet. My name is Todd Eisenstadt. I am the uh, Director for Research at the Center for Environmental Policy at American University. And we have a very, very good group of panelists today to discuss uh, our issue on the table, which is updating old actors and introducing new ones in the race to carbon neutrality. Today, we're really going to look at the role of the private sector after having talked in several of these webinars about really the, the need for stronger public sector participation. So we will uh, this time speak with um, a, a extensive group of panelists, Harry uh, God of the World Bank, Scott Sklar of the Stella Group, uh, Sha Yu, who is of the uh, Joint Global Change Research Institute of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and also of the University of Maryland, and with Elizabeth Sturkin of the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, I'm going to start with um, the presentation by Harry God, which will be carbon pricing to meet net zero emissions. He works as a senior climate change specialist in the carbon markets and innovation practice of the climate change group in the World Bank. He's been working on climate change related, related issues, especially on carbon markets and carbon pricing for more than 15 years and is currently coordinating the technical work, the program, of the Partnership for Market Readiness and the Partnership for Market Implementation. Thank you very much for joining us, and it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, you're muted. You're muted. Harry, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Thank you. Yes, we can. And you can see my slides as well, right? Yes. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. So what I'm going to do in my presentation, as Todd mentioned, uh, to give a little bit of overview of what role uh, no, carbon pricing can play uh, to meet uh, net zero goals. I'm not going in detail of the complexities around uh, implementation of the carbon pricing, but to give you a you know, 30,000 feet overview of like what's happening around the carbon pricing and then how carbon pricing can help uh, meet net zero goals. And especially, of course, also talk a little bit about uh, what private sector is already doing in the space. Um, so just to start with, of course, I think many of you are already familiar with and then the, uh, the discussion that's happening over a period of you know, one to two years right now, you know, with this 1.5 degrees pathway. And you know, the, I like this particular slide, which is uh, uh, from the McKinsey, uh, you know, that's clearly less how to know what the four requirements that needs to be taking place, basically, you know, uh, to meet 1.5 degree pathways. Uh, of course, like and we're meeting the uh, 50 to 55 percent net emission reductions by 2030 versus 2010 levels, and then of course net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, of course, the, uh, there's a huge debate on whether we should uh, use the you know the reference to the cumulative carbon budget because it's of course it all depends on how you estimate this one, and then of course again you know the uh, concept of the you know, common but differentiated responsibilities and how I just we need to distribute this budget available among different you know, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, but of course, the fact is that of course, there is a limited budget that is available if, if we wanted to you know, ensure that you know, the, the world uh, is 1.5 degree pathway. And then of course, in order to meet that one, of, and it's very clear that you know, the steep mitigation of non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions also need to be looked into, which I guess uh, some of our speakers are going on to talk about that. Uh, and this slide, of course, like we all know, um, the whole concept of net zero uh, 
a couple of years ago there's it's a very limited discussion about about this whole thing and now and you see you know everywhere um like you know, how I mean, how basically it fulfilled you know, across the you know, world and and then how many um nations and then subnational jurisdictions actually are already been taking or announced basically you know, implementation of the you know, uh, the targets as part of either their indices or as a standard and targets uh, right I mean, in two years time actually the net zero pledges you know from 16% of the global economy now which they're covering almost 70% of the of the global economy and this of course is 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 very you know encouraging to see how uh, how corporates are leading the way uh, and it's like you no know, we see them I mean, it's like you no know, almost like uh, more than 1500 companies and you know cover about 12, 12 trillion revenues and then and 3.5 gigatons of ghc emissions are already announced uh, you know uh, the net zero targets uh, but of course then there's a huge debate going on right now about I mean, how uh, how basically uh, these targets need to be comprehensive enough and then more clarity is needed around uh, how actually these targets are uh, are being formulated and, and then what are plans to achieve those targets uh, and then how basically the, the corporates are planning to communicate and then report them uh, on a regular basis. Um, but the bottom line is that you know, the corporates are leading uh, a big way uh, and of course, in addition to that one, of course, we also seen, of course, because this, the, I, I only included, a, you know, very few. I think there are so many uh, uh, initiatives and and, and uh, standards actually that are helping corporates in terms of how to define their net zero targets and then how to report actually and then how to basically assess the, the impacts of you know, uh, the different climate changes, both transition and the physical risks. Uh, and then what are the incentives that needs to be put in place to so, um, and take the corporates to, to take action. Uh, and this is basically the, the, the crux of the matter. I mean, it's like, you know, the, in spite of the fact that one of the targets are there, but I think who is going to pay for that one? Uh, for example, Energy Transition Commission an estimated that, you know, these uh, net zero emission goals actually require uh, almost one to three trillion a year and then IPCC in its 2018 1.5 degree report estimates that one or might take actually you know three trillion dollars that are needed um, uh, by, by mid-century to, to do this one and then if you look into the the existing investments that are happening uh, um, they are basically you know uh, one fourth of, of what is needed so the challenge is very critical and then and you might have also uh, heard earlier also that, of course, the public investment is not sufficient and governments cannot alone uh, take an action basically you know, to meet the, the, the challenge that we have and hence the, the role for corporates to play here is so critical. Uh, so here, of course, like, you know, one of the things that I am going to talk about is that, you know, of course, the, how carbon prices can create an incentive uh, like the private entities, of course, we know uh, you know, carbon pricing uh, can play a, a significant role in terms of incentivizing the action, and, and then of course uh, also to support uh, innovation that is that is needed, basically, especially with you know technologies uh, that are needed to to meet the the, the net zero targets. Um, carbon pricing, of course, along with the other regulations, policies, and standards, can can become a you know, a comprehensive policy package that could actually stimulate action at, at, you know, at, at all levels. And just to give you this one, of course, this 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 is taken from um, this last year's uh, World Bank State and Trends Report, and then this year's uh, report is going to be launched uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, from the from this one, of course, it is very clear that you know, carbon pricing is expanding. Um, it's now more than 60 jurisdictions have the explicit carbon pricing. When I say explicit, of course, it's either uh, emissions trading schemes or carbon taxes. Uh, and then, of course, there are several countries that already have some kind of implicit carbon pricing, which, which is not being captured very well in any of the you know the research that has been carried out so far. Um, uh, but but at the same time, um, the the price levels that are needed, uh, you, know, you know, to to meet the um, the targets is nowhere near to the what it is required. Um, for example, the 
a stickless stand report that World Bank commissioned a, a few years ago uh, stipulates that we need a price of forty to eighty dollars, uh, you know, to um, to to meet the the the, the goals. Uh, and then carbon pricing initiatives across the world uh, last year raised to uh, more than 45 billion revenues and, and then this year it is more than this one of course mainly due to you know the uh, what's happening with the eu ETS scheme where the price is now crossed almost at 55 euros as we speak uh, um, and then companies, uh, of course, where the industry, where the uh, governments are introducing uh, meetings, implicit or explicit carbon pricing, and then of course the the latest CDP report makes it very clear how how corporates are actually also uh, you know introducing their internal carbon pricing, you know, um, uh, basically in order to to get prepared actually either you know, to the uh, regular existing regulation in their jurisdictions or the the regulation that is anticipating in that one you know, either to uh, address the you know different risks such that that especially the transition risks that companies might face and, and it's very heartening to see how how many how actually the action at the corporate level is increased and then you know, from this uh, chart it is very clear that you no know, there's almost like 27 percent increase from 2019 level how many companies are now uh, planning to price uh, uh, within within the next two years and and, and then how um, close to 900 companies are already doing such some kind of a, a carbon pricing and and also of course there will be price levels again it also varies uh, that companies actually uh, put forward internally uh, though the medium price is uh, uh, around 25 dollars but of course that in the gdp reports that uh, even some companies have almost like 200 dollars basically now to um, um, to make some certain decisions on investments and, and then how they uh, estimate the risks uh, to their business uh, but again, I mean, so this is one thing actually that that needs to be uh, very you know well understood is that you know, the the carbon price that is needed to go decarbonize. And for there are several estimates like you know, 40 to 80 by 2030 and then 50 to 100 by 2100. And there is of course again an, uh, revised estimates that are ongoing as we speak. Uh, but the the price that is needed to you know decarbonize uh, this thing. Uh, it, it depends on the other policies that exist in, in, in the jurisdiction. And, and then, of course, here is one classic example of the exercise that we did, for example, in India, how how the carbon prices can vary in, in different you know, decarbonization scenarios. And then we can see the, the how the policy signal uh, in, in, in EU actually is causing the increase in the, uh, the EU allowance prices now at $55. And so one of the things that, of course, we are, and then, of course, like an IMF is also talking a lot recently, is that you know, how the revenues from the carbon pricing can can support uh, you know, these needed investments. Of course, carbon pricing alone is not going to solve the, the, the issue here, but, uh, um, but of course, a $50 per ton of CO2 carbon price in, in 2030 no, could generate actually around 1% of GDP for many G20 countries, and then it's much more actually in, in, in the other countries. Like as part of the Partnership for Market Readiness Initiative, the World Bank has, and then where we supported uh, almost like 23 countries with uh, some form of carbon pricing, it also made it very clear that you know, how countries are actually uh, looking into um uses of these re revenues especially you know to support you know private sector and, and then of course to reduce the burden in terms of you know uh, optimizing the existing taxes and then of course you know, helping the low income households with these revenues but the the, the bottom line is that so the carbon prices if designed well and then in combination with the other policies and the regulations uh, has a huge role to play you know to, to incentivize action especially for the commercial entities and this is, of course, very obvious slide. I mean, it's like you know, the you know, uh, for example, uh, the BlackRock uh, did you know some assessment on what the impact actually carbon tax might have on on different you know industries, and then you can see basically like you know how you know and the impacts of course in energy sector can be up to eighty percent in the FI region, and, and then 
and then this is of course the 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 drivers for corporate action uh, across different jurisdictions will normally fall into either it is because of the investor pressure or is it because of the you know the transition risk that they see uh, you know in response to the and uh, the gov- government's policies on 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 be it the electricity sector or is it the transport sector etc and then most importantly and then in the, this is the recently that what we have seen in many uh, asian and then of course western balkan countries where we are working is that how companies actually basically asking uh, putting the pressure on government and then and how the competitive concerns are mainly due to EU's you know, carbon border adjustment mechanism will have an impact on that one. Um, so these these are the main uh, drivers that are forcing basically corporates to take action uh, on climate change. Uh, and then of course, like what kind of engagement basically are we looking from the corporate sector? And, and then uh, many of you might have known about the World Bank's uh, Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition um, where uh, you know, more than 100 uh, you know, companies are part of this thing, either introducing some kind of internal uh, carbon pricing or, or in the plan, in the process of introducing in, in the next few years. So, um, so these are the things that uh, that many of the you know, companies that are as part of the CPLs are doing. Like, you know, as part of the internal carbon pricing, they are learning from others. They are committing to introduce such kind of internal carbon pricing, and then of course they are campaigning basically to, you know, the things that they are doing uh, to the especially to the government's attention as well. And then of course in the jurisdictions where uh, uh, where governments already introduced uh, uh, or in the process of introducing, you know, uh, ex, you know, explicit carbon pricing, so they are basically making efforts to support government, you know, in ensuring that the design of the, the policies uh, that is being introduced to look into the sector specific aspects and the cost sectoral aspects and et cetera. Uh, just to reiterate, of course, you no know, carbon pricing is not a silver bullet and alone is not sufficient. And then of course, we have seen in several jurisdictions, but you know, California is a very good example where uh, how you know, the different, uh, um, not just in carbon pricing, but of course, like, um, in LCFS and then the renewable portfolio standards and then big emission standards and etc. And then and then we have also seen in in EU um, and there especially in Germany so how basically you know the other complementary policies uh, are needed and then and can play a, a major role. Uh, and then just to I conclude by very quickly saying this is about the uh, some of the things that the, that the bank is doing to to support basically you know not just only the governments but also uh, the private sector uh, especially on on carbon pricing and then carbon markets. Uh, so the PMR is the one with the partnership for market readiness as I said. So which is concluding actually the next month and then the new new initiative what we call a partnership for market implementation where the focus is basically to support. Uh, Actual implementation of the carbon pricing instruments and then the CPLC, uh, you know, very well. It's a basically, you know, a, a voluntary initiative to catalyze action on uh, the carbon pricing at uh, the private sector level. And the recent task force on net zero goals um, um, uh, is the one actually that might be interested to some of you, basically, where we are trying to come up with this, some narrative on I don't know, how companies need to formulate their strategies basically to, to implement a net zero and then what role basically carbon pricing can play. And then finally, uh, uh, of course, like you know, many of the companies as part of their net zero strategies also considering I uh, make use of you know, carbon markets like you know, the so-called use of offsets. Uh, um, so there, of course, again, so through our climate warehouse program, so we are you know, piloting uh, some new concepts of uh, how these uh, these credits should be generated, especially under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, and 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 what the relationship of those things with the the voluntary markets, and then of course including the um, uh, dialogue with the task force on voluntary carbon markets that Mark Carney is leading. Um, so I I'll stop to here, and then happy to answer any questions uh, at the end of the uh, uh, the panel. Thanks. Over to you, Don. Thank you very much, Hari, uh, for that. Very, uh, very good introduction to the problem and also the reminder that setting good prices on, on carbon is essential, hasn't quite been achieved yet, and is part of a more comprehensive solution set. 
And to further present some other aspects of this, solutions to uh, mitigation problems, uh, I'm really pleased to introduce Scott Sklar, who is the president of the Stella Group, which has been uh, in operation since 2000 as a global clean energy technology optimization owner's representative firm facilitating clean distributed energy utilization and technology integration, primarily for commercial, industrial, institutional, infrastructure, and local government. Sklar serves as the energy director of George Washington University's Environment and Energy Management Institute. And previously, he served for 15 years as executive director of both the Solar Energy Industries and the National Bioenergy Industries Associations. And I just have to add another point to the bio, which isn't written here, which is that uh, Scott Sklar was a mentor. Uh, I was a undergraduate intern for him at the Solar Energy Industries Association a decade or two ago. And that has helped propel me forward in wanting to study this issue. So it's great uh, to have you here and to thank you also for joining us. Hey, thank you, Todd, and a pleasure to be here. Uh, is my uh, PowerPoint up there in the shared screen? It, it is. Your, your okay. desktop is also up here. Uh, okay, well, that's not good. So let's say view entire screen. How about that? Does that work better? Yes, okay. better. Thank you. All right, sorry. Um, so again, I have an owner, 21 year old ownership companies. I have projects all over the world. But I do want to say before I start, I blend all these technologies together, the entire portfolio of renewables, the entire portfolio of high value energy efficiency, and virtually every kind of energy storage. And I'm not selling anything, remember, I'm an owner's rep meeting, I help the third world village to the Fortune 100 company. And I teach three industry courses at GW, including the first course in the United States on renewable energy and critical infrastructure. So I just want to talk that we are in an evolution going on. Uh, I'm using McKinsey and Company because I love this, this chart and uh, of disruptive technologies. And as you may know, uh, we have cellular and satellites and fiber optics in a self-healing grid. When a cell tower goes down, it automatically is surrounded by other cell towers and keeps communications going. And the internet, when, the, when a data center goes down, which happens once a month, we don't lose the internet. They automatically uh, interact with each other and uh, surround the down system and take over. And we're in the midst of doing this with energy, with distributed technologies, renewables, with energy storage, and everything on the right of the internet of things, the mobile internet, and all of that. And of course, advanced materials, we're in a material science renaissance, uh, make a lot of this happen. So I just want to say this is an important trend as we talk about how the grids are changing from centralized power to distributed power. And we have a huge resource base here on clean technology. And as you see, this is a chart. Uh, done by DLR of Germany of, of the amount of energy we have hitting every day on this planet uh, versus what we need. And again, uh, we have a very small amount of things that, um, uh, that we can access this economically, but if you have 2,800 times more energy than you're using, you don't need to access that much solar. So I'm going to flip on some of these slides, but this is the most important one. Uh, this is the think tank, the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy. And what they're saying is by 2050, the U.S. could have energy use with technology we have today and cost effectively. And if you take my classes, you would know it is always less expensive to save energy than generate it from any source. So how do we do that? Well, we have financial tools. One of them is what we call energy service performance contracting, where a company comes in, and whether it's a third world village for LED lighting uh, or solar electric lighting or a uh, corporation, the entity comes in and says, we're going to finance this if you sign a 20-year contract. 
and it will cost you, uh, it will save you uh, 40% on your energy bill, but you're going to have to pay us. So it's only going to save you 18 to 20% of your energy bill, but uh, uh, after you pay us, but that's still with no money down, uh, you've just saved about 20% of your energy. So it's a way to make energy efficiency affordable, pay as you go from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich. And the problem is in the United States, we're creating green banks and other tactics like residential pace and uh, commercial pace and other, way, other types of approaches to lure companies, government and individuals into this dance because it is crazy. It makes economic sense. It has, by the way, immense impact, of course, on greenhouse gas emissions, but also regulated emissions and water quality. So that's it. And lastly, the other tactic that's so important that I wanted to get you excited on is on bill financing here in the United States, which is now being copied all over the world, where the state regulatory commissions or the municipal utility commission is saying, hey, uh, you, a individual can put the cost of an energy efficiency improvement, insulation, a, a very efficient heat pump or a geothermal heat pump or solar water heating or solar daylighting uh, on their utility bill and spread it over the life of the unit. And what's nice about that is, again, the additional cost per month is way lower than what they would pay for the utility electricity. So they're saving money, they're cash positive immediately. But more importantly, half the people and half the businesses lease their space. So this is tied to the lease, not the individual. There's no credit check. And if you give up your lease and or, or you you're, you decide to move elsewhere, uh, the, the next individual or, or company that rents the space has that extra payment on till it's paid off. And so it's a great way to, to enfranchise people who half of which in the United States don't own where they live or where they work and incorporate high value energy efficiency and some renewables. And so on bill financing is a trend in 22 states and in about 13 countries now. And we're gonna take over the world in doing this, but we need to push it faster. Um, and energy efficiency has taken a, a great play. It's, it beats up, if we didn't have it in the United States, 18%, uh, now it's a little more because this is an older chart, uh, we would have to produce. So um, uh, I'm skipping here because for some reason this brought up a, um, a, um, a, a bigger PowerPoint. Uh, 32 states can be self-sufficient in the United States, meaning this is the Institute of Local Self-Reliance Study, that they have the sustainable, and I stress sustainable renewable energy resources and with cost-effective technology today. And you see that most of the United States, in fact, uh, has overages. And of course, we have a transmission system, so we can send it to the states. Now, this particular map doesn't show, didn't, didn't include offshore wind or the marine energy technologies, uh, which would change the East Coast quite a bit. Uh, but in fact, we could power the United States with resources we have today, with technology we have today, less expensively. And I have uh, some maps here of what wind generation. Uh, this is, uh, we have over uh, the world, oh, clear over now uh, about 600 gigawatts or 600 nuclear power plants worth of operational photovoltaics, which is pretty exciting. And uh, when I started in this field 40 years ago and talked this way, I was ridiculed. So there we go. And this is an article showing uh, by Lazard that renewable energy continues to be cheaper than natural gas and coal. Absolutely. As is in most cases, biomass and geothermal. And we're starting to see now concentrated solar in certain parts of the world and, uh, and even some uh, uh, free flow hydro and, uh, and tidal energy. And so, and pumped hydro, uh, the under underappreciated uh, energy storage is the lowest cost energy storage. We were in a big battery storage boom, but 
pumped hydro is even less expensive and will dominate the world. And this shows you where countries have pumped hydro. Uh, biomass, uh, I'm talking about waste biomass is very important here. And so, but this shows the most least expensive places for energy in the United States. Um, this is the uh, a 2020 Abu Dhabi's 1.5 gigawatt tender uh, is uh, below a penny a kilowatt hour, or is a little over a penny a kilowatt hour, but uh, that's cheaper than you can, or less expensive than, than any other alternative. And with and adding batteries to it brings it to three or four cents a kilowatt hour, still less than natural gas or diesel or the traditional grid. So, and these are some uh, examples of very low cost uh, technology. And I just wanna say, we have 36 studies uh, that I give my class that shows again done, uh, that shows that with technology we have today and the renewable sustainable resource we have today, we can meet the world's energy needs and the US energy needs. And so I do want to uh, say that that's very, very critical. The one I like to use is the one done Sorry, by the National Renewable National Renewable Energy Laboratory that shows that if you want to do a 60 or 80 percent uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, this is the blend of technology: 57 percent energy efficiency, which I already talked about, and then the whole range of the different renewable energy technologies. And this did not actually include all of them, like I like to do. So. I want to end this by saying, uh, do we have technology all over the world? Yes. Uh, are we delivering it financially? Well, with energy service performance contracts for energy efficiency. For renewables, it's mostly power purchase agreements, and it works the same way in which a company comes in, signs a fixed price or slight escalator for 20 to 25 years for solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, and, uh, and an end user uh, commits to that. And the prices either are accepted by the utility as very cost effective or by the end user. I do a lot of industrial parks, for instance, like that, or schools or hospitals. And, and if you can't do power purchase agreements, mostly because of legal issues, you can do leasing, fundamentally the same thing where a third party brings in the money and the investment, and then the off taker signs an agreement at a pre-approved rate. So that's are the financial tools that are beginning to drive it. What we need from governments globally and individually and in federal, state and local are the incentives to uh, make this happen more aggressively. Right now, it's too anecdotally, and we're not going to meet our greenhouse gas reduction goals of the Paris Agreement unless we step up. And that's going to require uh, tools to excite and lure and make it easier to attract capital. Uh, we have the formats. We have the technology. We actually have willing customers. So that's the role of government. So with that, uh, I'm going to end and hope for some good questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Scott. That was a really enlightening presentation on how renewables are, are doing good things for the world and can also do well, right? For Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's Scott Sklar's lifetime, which is more important, I think. <laughs> OK, all right, thank you. Uh, and I think you also segued for us into the presentation uh, by Sha Yu, which will be on climate risks and financial systems in the 1.5 degree change future. And we look forward to her presentation. And, and I am very pleased to introduce her as a, uh, a researcher based at the Joint Global Change Research Institute of the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory Center for Global, and, and at the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland. Uh, she uh, is an expert in energy and environmental issues with a focus on climate finance, energy, and climate policies, and also on decarbonization pathways. She leads research on long-term deep decarbonization strategies in the United States, China, and India. 
it is a great pleasure to, to introduce you and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Uh, pleasure to be here. So yeah, I think this is kind of exactly complementary to Scott's presentation because I'm going to focus on financial sector, but not focusing on how the financial sector could, how can we finance the low carbon transition, but rather what are the risks financial institutions are going to face and in the low carbon transition uh, or in the 1.5 degree wars. So it's kind of more into the climate change uh, related risks or climate change mitigation related risks that I mentioned. Just to start, um, you may or may not be familiar with this chart, that climate change poses different risks to the stability of the financial system, particularly for the insurance and banking sectors. And it, the climate change does have significant impact on the physical environment we live in. We see more frequent, more frequent and or severe weather events like flooding, droughts, or storms in the past few decades than before, mostly due to human-driven or anthropogenic uh, climate change. So this event brings something we call physical risks that affect our society, but also have potential to affect the economy. Like for example, if some of these events happen more frequently, like people are more likely to become reliant on insurance to recover the cost of damages. And as a result, the insurance companies may have more to pay out and need to increase their premiums. So, and in the other case, say if households or companies are uninsured, they end up paying more on their own. So in either case, uh, we, as you can see from this particular chart, whether insured or uninsured, uh, this weather related losses are much higher than uh, rec in recent decades than like a few decades ago. Is there definitely annual variability, but the overall trend line is actually going up. And some of the events highlighted here make significant contribution in that given year, but they're not uh, exclusive for in that year. So losses from this extreme weather events have impacts beyond like say banking or insurance sector. They also have impacts on the wider economy. Like for example, if some of the weather related damages lead to fall in housing prices in certain regions, this, there could be a knock on effects on the overall spending in the economy. So just kind of summarize here, like uh, there are climate, there are physical risks for extreme weather events posed by potential climate change which would look, lead into a lot more risks and damages in the system we're living in or economy we're living in. And there is another dimension of the risk file is kind of more something we normally call uh, transition risks. So when the economy is moving towards carbon neutrality, certain sectors of the economy are going to face uh, significant shifts. For example, like massive coal retirement and power sector or increasing renewables. So uh, this shifts also indicate significant changes in potential asset values or higher business costs for certain sectors. And I think one study cited like, if we're moving towards a carbon neutrality world, about two thirds of the current fossil fuel reserves will now be burned forever. So they'll be on ground forever. And this would have a lot of implication for the energy companies that has already invested into this fossil fuel reserves. And this could also lead to changes in the value of the investment held by banks or insurance companies in sectors like coal oil and gas. So there are definitely going to be ripple effects if we're moving towards a carbon neutrality wars. And so correspondingly, some firms are choosing to reduce investment into fossil fuel sectors to help act early and manage risks. Like for example, like uh, companies like JP Morgan Chase recently announced uh, restrictions on financing fossil fuel infrastructure. And there are a couple of other uh, financial sector companies made similar announcement in the past one or two years. There are also efforts on information, information disclosure, which would help uh, investors or financial firms to make decisions based on informed information or informed decisions. The particular chart showing here, just kind of one general matrix we use to look at uh, transition risks, not everything, uh, which is normally called stranded assets. So this is IEA estimates uh, looking into potential stranded assets in decar decar decarbonization scenarios. 
And here we basically divide that into four different categories of stranded assets. The first one is the money that's spent on fossil fuel power plants and but cannot be recovered because they have to be closed due to emission constraints, which is kind of dark blue color here, roughly $120 billion per year. And the second category is money spent on oil exploration, but not be able to pay back because oil cannot be sold anymore or reduce oil consumption, which is kind of light gray color here. And the third category is basically money spending on gas exploration cannot be recovered. And the last one, the little one is the investment or stranded assets in coal mines. So as you can see that like oil gas assets plus like uh, fossil power plants are probably going to be the majority of the uh, stranded assets globally. And that's probably true for a lot of different regions. However, uh, the number itself may differ across studies. So there are a lot of studies on regional stranded assets, global stranded assets, they do give you slightly different numbers. And the other thing to note that is the potential transition risks for stranded assets are going to be very different for different regions. Like regions like China has very young coal fire uh, power plants would face much more significant challenges because they have to retire the power plants prematurely and they're going to have financial implications for the companies investing in these power plants. And for countries like uh, Japan, which may not have a lot of uh, fossil fuel infrastructure in the power sector, they may have slightly reduced uh, pressure in terms of transition, but still facing significant challenges if we're looking towards 1.5 degree pathways. So just kind of summarize what's been covered here, like in the financial institution generally characterize things in two categories. One is called physical risks and the other is called transition risks. For the physical risk dimension, we're mostly looking at the acute changes, kind of extreme weather events, but also chronic change, like gradual changes over precipitation, temperature, sea level rise, heat stress. All of this create additional challenges for the financial sector. And this has been actually studied by the sector for a couple of decades. And the transition risk is actually relatively new uh, for the financial sector because the concept of carbon neutrality or net zero 1.5 is relatively new. And there are a, a lot of uh, risks associated with transition, like policy risks, like what Harry mentioned, the carbon price is definitely a risk for some of the financial sector and coal phase out, energy efficiency improvement. There are technologies uh, like renewable hydrogen CCS, which are risks, but also opportunities. And there are also changes in consumer preferences like such as like mold shift in public transportation and would maybe reduce car ownership and would have additional implication for car manufacturer, but also upstream downstream in, in uh, industry like raw materials or steel uh, demand. So there's going to be a lot of effects throughout the whole economy. And one thing I should also note that we talk a lot about the risks here. There are definitely opportunities associated with translation. So looking to the risk profile is basically trying to help uh, financial institutions, including like banks or like central banks to respond better to potential uh, opportunities or potential futures. So there are a lot of opportunities for looking into uh, resource efficiency and also how we can work with companies to do early transition, build more resilient market environment. One particular effort I do want to highlight here is a, a recent effort done by the NGFS, which I'm actually also involved in this one. So NGFS is, uh, stands for Network for Granting the Financial System. So it's basically a consortium of, a, of central banks um, across different countries. And that looking into physical and transition risks associated with climate change. Uh, the Federal Reserve, I believe, just rejoined like this year. So the, the US is also part of this. And there are multiple teams like uh, in, engaged like us is here, but also PIC, YASA, uh, ETH, a couple of European teams involved in working together to provide analytical scenarios and results for the uh, banks to look into potential physical and transition risks. So we created like a bunch of scenarios along two different dimensions of physical and transition risks as just discussed. 
And on top of this one, we're looking at orderly and disorderly transition. Basically means like if there is a delay action in a carbon neutrality translation, what does that mean for companies or for different uh, agents? Whereas if we start transition as early as possible, would we end up in different worlds? And so one thing to note here is actually the overall message is like moving towards carbon neutrality is not bad at all. The, the higher risks are actually associated with delay in actions and this kind of abrupt changes. So if you can start transition as early as possible, that's actually lower costs and lower risks for uh, all the players. And of course, like we also have this kind of hot house work in the scenario matrix basically means like we're not doing anything more than what's in today. And it's kind of hot house work more like a 3.5 degree work. And that will be used for the banks to do the stress test. So basically translating what's in that scenario matrix into different scenarios like we're looking at into uh, orderly versus disorderly translation um, that would get us into deeper, different temperature targets like ranging from 1.5 to 3 plus targets. And all of this one would have uh, regional specific transitions like whether it's a, there's a delayed pathway or it's kind of straight line declining. I'm not going to go into the results at all, but just kind of selecting a few key regions, you would see like how the emission trajectories differ between the current policy NDC commitment and the 1.5 and two degree pathways. There is definitely going to be significant changes for all the countries or players uh, across the world to make much more than what they're committing today. And the degree of challenges are going to be very different across countries. And also, I think if you're looking at the different scenarios, you will see like technology share would differ across scenarios. And in some scenarios, you do see like in 1.5 orderly translation, you see a lot more solar uh, wind in the very early stage, whereas in the disorderly translation, you see a little bit less wind and solar. So all of this one would have different composition of underlying energy system, which would have implication for the future investment and financial institutions are basically doing building on this information to do stress, stress tests and then getting additional information uh, to make guidance on uh, whether the potential measures they can take to mitigate risks. So I think I will stop here and turn that back to Todd. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Shaw, very much for highlighting the transition in the financial sector needed to accommodate the demands of climate mitigation and adaptation as they hope, hopefully continue also to design new tools and modalities of financing renewables, mon monetizing carbon prices, and also monetizing perhaps the risk, which we look forward to hearing more about. Um, and I want to again thank our last presenter, but not least, also uh, Elizabeth Sturkin of the uh, Environmental Defense Fund. She is going to talk about the question, what do large corporations need to focus on in the next 10 years on the journey to carbon neutrality? Uh, Elizabeth Sturkin is managing director at the Environmental Defense, Defense Fund where she leads work with companies for the EDF plus business team, leveraging the power of the marketplace to create a thriving planet. She launched EDF's partnership with Lyft to change their cars to 100% electric vehicles by 2030 and Working with Microsoft, she created and launched Transform to Net Zero, a coalition of nine leading companies who aim to show the way to net zero climate emissions for companies and the world. She created uh, the first NB NGO partnership with Walmart, addressing all aspects of their environmental impact on climate, oceans, and ecosystems, resulting in uh, changes in uh, that giant retailer's supply chains. Uh, we really are very appreciative of her willingness to join us today and, and thank you. Thanks so much, Todd. I'm very excited to be here and to be at American University. Um, so let me see if I can get this to move to the next slide. There we go. Um, the, 
the focus of my talk is really the companies and what companies need to do on the path to net zero and in particular over the next 10 years. So we we know everyone knows in 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 this world our our world here that we must cut emissions by half in the next decade. So we need to reach net zero by 2050 and in particular we need to dramatically limit the release of short-lived climate pollutants. So we've got a lot to do in the next 10 years and I wanted to talk about companies in this time frame because what I'm seeing is um, basically that business leadership will be critical to get us there. Uh, I know we've just had the the climate summit by the Biden administration and the American America is back in and trying to step in on climate change. But the reality is that um, certainly for my career over the past 20 years, it's been business that's led in many ways. Um, and and I, and I continue to believe that business leadership will be critical to get us there working with the public sector and others. We've really seen companies step up to, you see in 2020, the number of net zero commitments. And I think Hari also mentioned this. It's just really uh, inspiring. And even during the past uh, administration that companies were still stepping forward and leading on climate change. But the thing that I am seeing is that, you know, with the focus to net zero, um, which is a few years away, um, companies are not really necessarily understanding what needs to happen in these next 10 years. I think that is a really critical question that we need to answer because we know that the choices we make in the next 10 years will affect both the ease at which we will transition to a climate stable future and when we will get there, when we will get to um, a, a, a 1.5 degree uh, temperature scenario. This is really a critical slide from a Pathways to Net Zero report that EDF did with Deloitte. And this is what is, is essentially needed here. We need to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions, including short-lived climate pollutants like methane, of course. Um, we need to also remove long-lived climate pollutants. So protecting, establishing carbon sinks, investing in negative emissions technology, um, that will get us to net zero. And I will go ahead and read this part to you. It's net zero is the practice of a company sector or economy neutralizing the further climate impact of all of its greenhouse gas emissions beginning in a certain year by reducing all emissions possible and then offsetting residual emissions with removal strategies. Net zero by 2050 refers to the goal of achieving no additional warming impact from greenhouse gases by that year. And often what I am seeing from companies is that they are confounding what net zero means for the planet versus what it means for them as a, as a company. They get very focused on removals, you know, planting new trees, instead of really thinking urgently of both reducing their own emissions and also trying to avoid emissions and invest, invest in um, avoided and redu re reduced emissions offsets. So here's what I'm seeing companies should do. They should have shorter term science-based decarbonization goals with milestones. Um, they really must focus on short-lived climate pollutants you all may have caught the recent report, I believe it was from the United Nations on methane and how urgent it is to reduce methane. And companies really must act with urgency to protect the world's carbon stocks, such as tropical forests. So to follow, to follow and support um, Hari and the use of the markets, I, I really want to emphasize how um, EDF believes that the use of high quality carbon credits can really help speed the transition to net zero. They're for use in the short term and the medium term. They absolutely must have environmental integrity and be integrated in a clear pathway to decarbonization. The company must have its own short term goals, milestones, and be internally decarbonizing but it really accelerates near-term mitigation opportunities and is critical in hard to abate sectors. Um, it is needed and useful to speed the transition. 
Nature-based solutions, high quality carbon credits can enhance reductions and removals in the near term and contribute funding to things like saving tropical forests. The use of markets we have shown from analysis can really increase the level of climate ambition and cut the cost of doing so. The challenge is that we need all of those tools and we need broad engagement from companies. Companies really need to look beyond their four walls. We're asking a lot, but that's what's needed. They need to do their own part with their own operations, their own supply chain, their own value chain, and then take, really take responsibility for the planet getting to um, a, a stable climate. And I think that there's this danger where companies get so focused on achieving their own goals that they, they could achieve their own goals and the planet would still be in a, in a bind. And we've got to do that by addressing urgent issues like deforestation that may be outside the value chain. Um, and critically important is companies must prioritize changing markets, rules, systems, and engage in policy advocacy. Um, politicians need to know that climate is an existential, existential threat and the companies realize that it's going to impact their business in the future, so they're going to prioritize it. We need companies investing now. Um, and I wanted to make mention of the report that I referred to, which uh, talks about this transition, but also talks about sector pathways in particular for agriculture and transportation and the role of influential uh, industries like retail and technology and what that path looks like, giving guidance both on, on what needs to be done in the sector and what needs to be done um, to do broad systems change. Thanks. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that call to companies to think outside the box and outside of the value chain. Uh, it seems that your point about having concrete specific strategies to put forth for companies and also trying to diminish the daunting task of trying to meet net zero, breaking it into pieces and looking especially at the next decade is, is a very um, important way for us to think about that. So thank you very much. And I guess uh, we have some questions from the audience. I think as I as the moderator, I have the the mic and the chance to maybe ask just a, a quick first question, which I would I think do to to all of the presenters. I, I would ask, I think to Hari, um, you know about the you know the the failure of carbon pricing. I mean, carbon as you demonstrated, we really haven't reached the sort of Paris uh, prices in in almost any country, with two or three exceptions. And I guess the question is, how do we how do we motivate um, the the private sector, in particular, but also governments who are going to be setting these policies to really help us get that going? I think to um, to uh, to Scott and also to Shai, I think as they had somewhat complementary presentations, it seems the question is about the the financial sector and instruments and loans and sort of tools available to make renewables in particular, but other sorts of financing more accessible, how can, how can we incentivize companies to look beyond their past and traditional risks and to look forward at, you know, at how to reduce, uh, to, to reduce risks in the marketplace uh, for, for all, rather than narrowly looking at their own risks as as they must first right in order to survive in business but how do we how do we i guess we being citizens and governments motivate um i guess the financial sector companies in particular banks and insurance companies etc to to get this ball rolling more strongly and i think that also to to elizabeth i guess the question is it seems that companies definitely as you said have their own uh, milestones and goals, and, and that's all well and good, but how do we get, how do we really incentivize companies to really be 
participants in solving this collective action problem. I mean, it seems that companies fundamentally are not built to do that. They're built to, to make profits, which, which is fine. I mean, that's, that's what we're a capitalist system. That's what we expect from them. They're neutral with regard to other social actions, or at least that's theoretically what they are. How do we get them to have a positive view as companies rather, I mean, certainly citizens, certainly administrators and companies and managers would have positions as citizens, but as companies, how can they be incentivized? It seems like this whole question is about how does the private sector get incentivized to be part of the solution because it's just not part of what they're, what they're made to do, right? And we're asking something really big and additional from them and they're not getting anything back in a narrow sense from that. So I guess that's, that would be the starting question. And I, I can, uh, maybe I'll proceed. We have about a half an hour. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll also throw open to some of the other questions if that's okay. Um, so, so we have a question about how many people are going solar these days and that solar and or wind energy may not be green according to the questioner due to the fact that solar panels and wind turbines are not easy to recycle and sometimes not recyclable at all. So the question is, if a lot of tons of solar waste is projected, where are the heavy metal, you know, where, where there are heavy metals and solar panels, how do, how do we tackle this upcoming sort of side effect of renewable energy increasing usage? And as the questioner says, what, what looks like an upcoming catastrophe. Um, another question with regard to uh, renewables is on, the question is a very succinct one with droughts and melting of glaciers, will this impact pumped hydro? Okay, another question regarding carbon taxes, um, which has drawn and, and other mechanisms, I guess, uh, um, trading systems, emissions trading systems have drawn opposition from NGOs for many reasons, such as the price is too low, which we just mentioned, or two, it is difficult to enforce, or three, it falls disproportionately on the poor, and among others. What are ways to design policies to address these concerns? Another question, uh, China just built the Three Gorges Dam that delivers uh, 22,500 megawatts of power. Uh, or twice as much as all the nuclear stations in Britain put together. If solar and wind fail in the future, will hydropower come to dominate? And um, might it become our only source for power? Another question, um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of them. Hopefully you can take note and see if you're able to address a particular one. Uh, the next one is that the Biden administration wants to expand Amtrak and its network, uh, while China and Japan have the maglev uh, train systems. Should the United States start to build maglev instead of railroads to reduce the carbon footprint? And I guess a, an add-on question I would extend on that one is, you know, how do we get the actual and in public investment, which would be massive, needed to do that? That's going to be a great infrastructure to have in the long term, but in the short term, how do we raise the money? And maybe, I guess there the question is, what, what kind of role would the private sector have? It seems like a, a prime a prime way that the private sector can come to, into play. All right, another question or two. Different greenhouse gases have different potency for contributing to global warming. Do private sector strategies need to reflect the differences among the types of emissions more forcefully? Okay, uh, another question. I should just say that this is from Dan Fiorino, who's the director of the Center for Environmental Policy. Um, a shout out and a thanks to him for sponsoring this series. He has a two-part question. Um, are decarbonization and net zero possible without some sort of carbon pricing? Is there any preference for a panelist between a tax and a cap and trade, or I guess it would be also called ETS system, um, or is it more a matter of just what the prices are? Okay, uh, a question from one of my students to Scott Sklar. Many green banks in the US exist at the state level. Some are working more with neighboring organizations, but given the importance of interconnectivity to an efficient and resilient energy sector, what federal policies can drive greater regional collaboration in the future? And the last question for now 
Um, and uh, these are good questions. I haven't edited them very much. I mean, all of the questions are really good. So thank you to the audience. What can ordinary citizens do to motivate business corporations and banks to help get society to net zero? That's a good question to sort of end this round on. And let's see if maybe another round follows, but that's a lot for now. So thank you, uh, panelists. I guess if anyone just wants to start in and then when they finish, someone else can. I, I, it seems like that would be a good way. Maybe we can start, maybe we could go in the, in the reverse order of the presentations. Maybe that would be better. Is that okay? Um, Elizabeth, would you like to sure. start? Sure, I'll, I'll jump on in. Um, so I've been doing this work for over 20 years, always um, voluntary corporate partnerships. And I never thought I'd still be doing it. And like I said, you know, I think it's still really needed. The uh, business needs to lead the way to show that there's a win-win. I mean, back when I started, there was no win, you know, win-win. There was no, it was like, oh, it was, uh, you know, environment versus business, that's been proven wrong. Now business is needed to show how to invest in early technology, to um, raise the bar um, and to push policymakers. But it's, ne it's never it was going to be enough, right? We need regulation. There's just no two ways about it. So you need voluntary efforts in addition to, <laughs> I don't know, there are people walking into my office. I don't know <laughs> during my presentation. Um, you need voluntary efforts. You need regulation. So, what's going to incentivize companies? Some companies are just going to realize. The smart companies are going to realize. They're going to open up the IPCC. The CEO is going to say, "Oh, how is my business going to even exist in this world? Or how is it going to thrive?" They're going to figure it out and they're going to make money on it. They're going to transform. Those are the leading companies. Companies in the middle will be pulled along by others. That's what we're hoping for with Transform to Net Zero. And the rest of them, you've got to push them with regulation. There's no other way. Um, I can comment on a couple of the other uh, questions. Um, the, you know, do you need to address the different greenhouse gases with different global warming impacts? Absolutely. I think that research from EDF and to others, and I mentioned the UN report on methane, the short-lived climate pollutants, it's just, it's really critical to address right now because it dramatically affects how painful it's going to be or relatively easy it's going to be to get where we need to go. And that's generally, that's two sectors, that's oil and gas, and that's ag. And ag's really hard, right? Really hard to figure out how to reduce um, em emissions from animal agriculture. Uh, right now. So again, maybe using offsets to try and speed that transition. So absolutely, we need to, um, to have a differentiated approach depending on, um, depending on the different greenhouse gases, and we need to go full throttle on all of them. And then the, as to the question of, you know, um, what's going to push progress, I think that was that le the last question. Um, you know, and what's going incent to incentivize or what's going to get companies to act? You know, I think that um, we've tried for years, my, with my, my work for years, to show, prove the business case, show the data, can, you know, talk to the CFO. That's all really important. But you know what else you've had? You've had um, Greta Thunberg, right? You've had the youth activism movement, right? You've had people on college campuses. You've had employees uh, who, who have tremendous power in many companies because they're shareholders demand change. Hari mentioned investors too. Like a lot, a lot of pressure to act and to lead. And so I think what we need now is not just those net zero commitments, we need the transition plans and milestones to, to reach those and the transparency and reporting on, you know, how they're doing on those. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Shah? Yeah, thank you. And these are really, really interesting questions. I think I can probably touch upon some of them. Let's see. I guess there are probably a couple of questions on the relevance of the solar or hydro kind of investment. I guess one kind of general answer for that one is like, for the net zero transition, solar and wind are not the only solution. We have to 
put in a suite of solutions, a combination of solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, CCS, or even direct air capture, and definitely, and also include like increase in land sinks. So there are definitely going to be trade-offs of using different technologies in there, but they also have their own each pros and cons. So I don't think like any single country is going to bank on single technology. It's going to be a combination of all of them. And it's really good questions on the uh, oh, end of life management for the solar panel. They're definitely very recently through in the past year or so looking into that one. I think we don't really have, I guess, like commercialized solution yet, but there are definitely a lot of efforts looking into end of uh, management for solar panels. But overall, if you look at life cycle, say GHG emissions, wind, solar, nuclear have much lower life cycle GHG emissions compared to uh, coal or gas power plants. So that's kind of another metrics for consideration. Um, the uh, carbon pricing, uh, I actually have another work of my stream, which is on Article 6 modeling. So it's, I guess it's kind of getting into the why like Article 6 is important because it does, for, for the developing countries, it can actually give them the financial revenue to invest in clean energy infrastructure. So there are additional benefits associated with carbon market just in addition to the emission reduction. So I think that's something that has to be fully considered on this kind of societal benefits or co-benefits coming along with low carbon, uh, low carbon development or carbon pricing policies in there. Uh, I think there's a minor question on the uh, glacier mountain hydro impact. Yes, that does have impact. And we do see evidence in is particularly South Asia countries the, the mountain glaciers and the changes in extreme weather events or climate have significant impacts on their overall power system, also power outage for different seasons. Great, thank you. Um, I, I wonder, I think Scott may have had a technical problem, but um, Hari? Yeah, thanks, Todd, so excellent question. So maybe, I think there are three questions, uh, including yours. So maybe uh, just to answer the question, on like, you know, the, you know, why carbon prices are you know, so low and then why they're not being considered as so effective so far? Because in my view, it is something to do with, you know, four things. One, starting with the narrative. Um, when I say narrative in the sense like, you know, because realizing or recognizing that carbon pricing, you know, doesn't happen in vacuum, uh, and it needs to be actually as part of the policy package. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it needs to be complemented by other policies and regulations uh, because that is essential, uh, not just only to um, make its effectiveness uh, more, but also to minimize the, the the pricing that is needed basically to you know to introduce in sectors. And then of course, and then that actually linked to the second point is the, the political economy issue. Uh, because so far what we have seen is the carbon pricing has been more popular in EU and then uh, the Western world. But I think in the in the developing world you know, that we have seen clearly, for example, in South Africa, where it took almost a decade basically to introduce carbon tax. And one of the one of the lessons actually they learned is that you know, not using the word tax would have actually you know, you know, uh, improved actually their chances of you know, implementing that, that, that policy much more, much more earlier than, than what it, it took actually. So the political economy, of course, obviously distributional aspects is very, very important in developing world where, um, but having said that one, because the paradox is that you now because of the you know, low electrification rates and then the low energy consumption of many of the households, you know, for example, the carbon tax could be a progressive actually in those world, but 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 because there is no knowledge or the capacity to understand actually what exactly the you know the implications of introducing certain policy is is being you know considered as one of the major stumbling blocks that is based on our experience. And then the third issue is of course you know, related to again the capacity, but also the the technical issue. When I say technical issue, like you know, how basically you need to design the the system. That includes basically the proper choice of the instrument, be it actually carbon tax or ETS, which is the best actually, uh, because it's not a simple you know, black and white answer. Like you know, if someone asks like, you know, whether I should choose a you know, carbon tax or an ETS, because it depends on the jurisdictional you know, context. 
Um, and, and then post-COVID, we, what we have seen in many countries is that because many countries have a fiscal deficit and then there's a very, very tight, you know, constraint on revenue, right, you know, on additional financing raising from other uh, resources. So where um, we have seen right now, and then the bank is working with the several other countries, like you know, where, how the carbon taxes actually can fill some of the gaps, basically, in terms of the raising the necessary revenue to to, to address, uh, you know, address some of the, the fiscal constraints that they, that they have. Um, but again, so it's because there is a the balance that needs to be you know, maintained because we utilizing these carbon revenues for the fiscal and versus basically you know using those resources to um, to optimize the existing taxes and then to address some of the distributional aspects. Um, so that's of course there's a, there's a challenging, but 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 there are technical solutions to do that one. And then we have several examples to quote. And then one thing which is very positive toward is also that you now because of the you know, the PMR partnership for market readiness now 23 developing countries are at different stages of introducing the you know either carbon tax or emission trading scheme. And then now under the partnership market implementation, the new initiative. So we have already received a um, uh, response from 32 countries, basically either to uh, implement the carbon pricing or, carbon, or to build their capacity or readiness to, to introduce the, the carbon pricing. And then finally is the communication strategy, I mean, which is the very, very critical actually in these, in these countries, basically like, you know, we have seen actually in many countries that's where basically, you know, uh, you know, the countries fail basically to communicate what the policy objective is, what it intends to achieve, and then what is the impact on different stakeholders. And we have seen in France, and then we have seen in Colombia, and then in Chile last year, you know, the protests against this carbon tax, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is the, so critical actually for them to have well-developed, uh, you know, uh, communication strategy. I think I will stop it here. I hope this covers the some of the three questions that I that that were asked actually related to the you know, the, the carbon you know, pricing aspects. Thanks. Thank you very much. We we've had one more question introduced, um, also by by one of my students, a doctoral student who who asks that says that offsets are critical to the net zero story. Can you discuss some of the challenges to qualifying? How effective different offsets can be. Yeah, I think that also, I think uh, Elizabeth raised the point of sort of high quality offsets, right, or, or a, a qualification of the offsets as opposed to any offsets. And I guess I guess that's part of that question. And then after that, I wonder if any of the panelists would like to ask other panelists questions. That might be fun. Um, so the question, Todd, is about offsets and what is needed to define quality or what? I, yes, I think so. How, how would you define quality offsets? Or I think I, I forgot what qualification you had in your talk for offsets. You, you mentioned yeah. sort of, yes, you mentioned carbon credits, um, quality right. carbon credits. That's right. Yes, quality is important, <laughs> and, and it's really um, not well defined, at least with regard to the voluntary carbon market. Right. That's why you've seen a profusion of efforts. EDF had um, a mobilizing voluntary carbon markets effort to try and talk through some of these issues. There's the Mark Carney Task Force, um, some other initiatives that are really all struggling with this issue. Um, and in addition to, to other, um, other challenges, because we know that if you're going to use carbon credits, um, then, it, and, and for them to, uh, you know, do what they're intended to do, um, they've got to be high quality and really reduce emissions. And so, um, you know, many of the different standards are wrestling with these things. And so in, it's an area really where, you know, we need more standardization. We need governments to step in probably and help, help define this. Um, I think that what companies can do to try and help is um, advocate uh, on this issue and get involved. And for, for, um, for government or for companies themselves to just be really be transparent. I think that's a real way to try and help, um, you know, help 
move acceptance of uh, carbon credits is just be very transparent about um, about the efforts. N nothing is perfect. Um, and you know we had that recent announcement, the LEAF initiative that um, EDF helped get going along with Emergent and a number of companies, including Amazon, uh, to speed a billion dollars of um, investment in tropical forests along with the governments of Norway, UK, and the US. Um, and it really is the kind of scale of investment that is needed to protect tropical forests. And they are using the ART tree standard, which is just considered the you know, highest quality, highest integrity standard for um, the protection of tropo tropical forests under JRED. Um, others know much more about, about this than I do, but I think that's, that's the way to proceed forward, certainly in this era um, where the voluntary market is exploding, is be very transparent, uses, use the highest quality uh, uh, standards out there, and also um, press for improvement and in, in this issue. Okay, thanks. So maybe thought to add to add to what Elizabeth just mentioned. So that means so we have two decades of experience in the Kyoto market actually on carbon credits. Um, I means like so the the challenge with the the quality that we normally measure is you know with respect to how how baselines were set up for these these projects and then how the so called additionality is being demonstrated. I means like you no know, the I means. The, these challenges are still exist, and then especially, you know, Red Plus projects where I mean, it's like, you know, how we need to set the reference levels, so, so which is very contentious actually, and it's because of, you know, jurisdictional preferences and on these things. And now, given that, you know, each country has their own indices, and then indices have unconditional and conditional target, that means countries need to meet their unconditional targets first before you know, they meet uh, or they even consider basically transferring some of these credits to uh, to uh, to, uh, to others so here the challenge lies basically like you know, because countries one side we wanted to increase the ambition of the country that means like you know, their unconditional targets needs to be increased that means like if that is the case then there is a perception or there is a, some of the countries are thinking that means like for the availability of the credits that they can sell to others is basically will be is reduced so that means like you know, there is a potential that the the baselines could be artificially inflated i mean so that leads to basically hot air i mean like what we so called call it. and of course obviously that also might actually lead to overselling of these credits to others so i mean like these are all related to the quality of the credits i mean so now the task force on voluntary carbon markets that i mentioned the mark carney uh, initiated he is specifically also talking about this one and establishing some kind of a core carbon principles, what they are calling it as. Actual operationalization of that is still a challenging, and then we need to, to see basically how different standards apply those 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 CCPs and and then ensure that you know, the credits ultimately develop is basically or high quality. And then there are additional attributions like you know, for these credits should not lead to any you know gender related issues and then they don't compromise basically the environmental and social safeguards of those things and then they are, don't harm the local communities and etc i think when you add these both technical and the non-technical aspects i think that is what makes basically these offsets high credit worthiness and then it's obviously the the verification and validation of these and then enforcement of these principles is, is going to be a challenging one and then i think we learned a lot and then we hope that both these uh, uh, TSBCM and the Article 6 under the Paris Agreement is going to look into this much more basically and then come up with some kind of a objective criteria for assessing these things because that's what is going to is the was the most criticism by NGOs that no, they were so subjective in the past that when anyone can actually interpret that one and different and then and demonstrate that no therefore their credits are high high credit worthy. Okay, thanks. But if I can just I think follow up a little bit, it seems that some of the technical difficulties in measuring these sort of quality emissions for carbon, for credits or for offsets um, are seemingly not, I mean, not necessarily the fault of companies at all. It just, it seems as, as Hari seems to have referenced, the Paris Agreement has not uh, really codified this. We're all sort of waiting for that to happen. And perhaps until we get a sort of nomenclature, a measuring system, accountability, baselines that are sort of universally agreed upon, we are not going to be able to start to create the kind of 
currency of, of, of emissions trading and, and understanding how, how that works with precision. And sort of, it, it's gotta, we've gotta have carbon budgets, we've gotta have, uh, you know, currency, and we have to be able to measure, we need a, you know, a, a, someone to be the authority on this, a, a central carbon banker, if you will, right? We don't have that. How do we get this so that companies can have the guidance they need? Because until, they, they, until there's a structure in place, we can't really move forward in a, in a very comprehensive way, right? Or is that is that over critical? I, I don't know. No, oh, if if I can, no, if I may totally. say, yeah, go go ahead, Hari. No, no, go go ahead. I'll do it. Sorry. Well, I guess this is the void into which companies have stepped forth, and and NGOs, right? NGOs have been trying to help um, clarify things. I I mentioned I, I put in the chat our uh, carbon credit buyers guide that we created with WWF and OCO Institute, and we're working on to. Um, working on trying to do the further um, efforts to try and help figure out, uh, okay, what would meet quality criteria in the voluntary carbon market? Because that's what like literally everyone is wondering from the individual person who's trying to offset their, um, you know, a airline travel to, you know, a, a corporation that's trying to kind of figure out, oh, we've got to, we want to claim carbon neutrality. How would we do that in a way that has integrity? everyone, all of those entities all have the same challenge. So in that void, Todd, you're so right. Like, man, darn it. Why didn't they figure out article six? Why didn't they get, yeah. it, why didn't they get that done? Didn't happen. And we can't wait, right? We cannot wait. We need the, um, the carbon market to speed money to protect tropical forests, to invest in new technologies. And so that's why you have initiatives like um, the LEAF initiative and others that are just marching forward and um, trying to do so with integrity. And, uh, you know, I, as I said, the, 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 the um, it, it's NGOs that are stepping into that void. And it, I just would urge companies to be extremely transparent about what they're doing and try and engage in the process to create a really robust system. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? I think that's a that's a very good uh, point, I guess, on which to conclude. It seems that we started this session sort of casting uh, a critical eye at the role of the private sector and whether it's incentivized or not to, to do big things. But it seems that ultimately we've also turned it back on the public sector or at least the international community and the public uh, diplomacy of the international community and with a sort of requirement of sort of codifying what Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is going to be so that we can go forward with a lot of these initiatives. So anyway, um, thank you for, for illuminating a lot of questions and, and also providing some, some answers. And um, it's been a, a fascinating journey on these webinars. Uh, thank you to, to our guests today and to all of you for joining us. And um, if you're on our mailing list, we know where you live, so at least electronically. So um, stay tuned. We will have more webinars next year. We're going to break for the summer, but, um, but we thank you all very much for, for uh, making these webinars possible. And we hope that they've been useful. And um, I thank our guests again for joining us. And... Um, appreciate your comments and wish you a fantastic spring and um, let's get to work, I guess. That's right. Thanks, Todd. Thank, Thank you. you, Todd. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.